Hello, welcome to Video Creators Lounge. This is our inaugural podcast, our first podcast. We have a very special guest with us today. His name is Tony Schultz. He is an audio engineer. He's been an audio engineer for over 30 years in the Boston area. He has some great stories that he's gonna tell us about his whole career. And towards the end, we're gonna talk a little bit about some tips and tricks about audio recording and a whole host of other things. So. Welcome, Tony. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I have a, a great admiration for people that really know the craft of recording, and you are certainly that person. You've been doing it for 30 years, and why don't you tell us a little bit about how you started off and, and where you are now and what you're up to? Well, uh, yeah, it's been a long time. I, I didn't actually know for, you know, I started playing guitar when I was a kid, and I didn't really know I was going to be in audio for quite some time, actually till like it wasn't until like the tail end of high school that I kind of considered it, but I, I kind of wanted to be a musician for a good amount of time as a kid. I played through all, all kinds of groups and stuff and, and realized that being a musician wasn't going to be good enough as a career for me. I, didn't, I felt like I'd, the gigs that would have been available to me as a musician weren't exactly what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So my guitar teacher, who was in high school with uh, two years ahead of me, went to Berkeley and he went into music production engineering and I stayed in touch with him over the holiday breaks and stuff. He came home, come home for a vacation. And, and he was talking about the program at Berkeley in music production engineering. And I was like, wow, that's cool. And I just, you know, I kind of looked up to this guy anyway, cause he's a really good guitar player and he seemed to do really well when he went to Boston. So I looked into the program and I was, you know, I'd kind of tinkered around a little bit in high school with some four track stuff with, at a friend's house and, and thought that might be fun to do. And also, you know, going to Berkeley, you learn your instrument as well. So it wasn't like I was giving up everything I'd built up. It was just, I'm playing guitar and I'm learning how to do audio recording. So that's kind of what ended up happening as far as my college choice, which I always said is was a perfect choice for me as far as I didn't really know it at the time, how perfect it was, because it was very difficult. You know, college is difficult for anyone. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, when you go to a place like Berkeley and you're like the lowest person on the totem pole compared to all the other students that have been, I mean, just amazing players from all over the world, it's just really intimidating. And sometimes, <laughs> you know, at that time, Berkeley had a reputation for students going there for like a year and dropping out. And it's just, it was no kidding. partially that it was intense, but it just was like, you know, when you went there, you were very overwhelmed that everybody was better than you. So, so, but now this was in the, the eighties, right? Yeah. 84 to 88 is when I went. Yeah. And where did you grow up? In the Midwest, uh, you know, kind of was, lived in Michigan, Indiana when I was a kid, but mainly from my high school days, uh, in like the Chicago area, sh Chicago suburbs. When I wasn't like in the city, but uh, my family, you know, my my uh, sister and brother and my mom still live out that area. So, okay. I, you know, I go there once in a while. So this was a, a big change when you uh, went to Berkeley. It must have been <laughs> eye opening coming to Boston for the well, first time. I had it? never I had never seen Boston. I'd never seen Berkeley. Um, and I just put all my stuff in the car and my dad, dad and I drove out the first, you know, the first time. Sure. Um, and what was funny, and this is back, you know, with maps and, you know, there's no right, right. iPhone and stuff. <laughs> right, so. right. So it's like a thousand mile trip and it was two days, you know, we stopped over somewhere in the middle and just kind of just driving, you know, like the whole, it was like a pilgrimage, right? And then we get close to Boston and then we're like, where's Berkeley? Like, how do we, how do we get there? We didn't, we mm -hmm. had an address, but you know, on a map, like we didn't have sure. a map of Boston. So it was, it was just kind of funny. I was overwhelmed as I was that, you know, we kind of got lost like the, before I even got to school and I got a little <laughs> freaked out that, you know, like, oh my God, you know, we're in this city and we don't even know how to get to the school I'm going at. But yeah, it was an intense journey, the four years of that. Met a lot of great people, learned a lot from the teachers there and you know, practiced my guitar a lot, learned about recording. And uh, that was a very intense time for me. Third third year and fourth year at Berkeley, I was a mess as far as physical, just. Sure. You know, so I was, I was needing a break um, after that four years of intense, mm -hmm. you know, but I always believed that that intensity prepared me for my career. Instead of going to New York, I chose my, you know, my own thing to do in my own apartment to start. Um, and I did that for quite some time before I kind of went to a commercial space and then almost lost everything because I went in over my head financially with stuff. And you know, that was... Well, yeah, I want to now I want to talk about that. But okay. Right now. So just for the audience here, tell us a little about where you're at now in your studio now. Now? And the name um, of it. Okay. So my, the studio is called Big T Productions. Mm -hmm. And I celebrated 30 years this past January. So it's been 30 and a half years. And so, yeah, so I had a studio for that long. I've had three locations, the apartment. I had a location downtown in Chinatown. And then in 2000, I moved to where I'm at now in North Quincy. But um, I also, along and the way, became an audio educator. I taught at the New England Institute of Art 
for 20 years and now currently for about, I think it's been almost four years now, I've taught for Berkeley Online. So he, here you are coming from the Midwest, mid 80s, go to Berkeley, come to Boston for the first time, whole new world. You adapt pretty quickly. You go through college. It was grueling. And then after school, you took a little break, but not too long. And you immediately opened your uh, yeah, it wasn't production too much, company. Uh, it wasn't too much. Uh, like six months later, my business started as a four track studio. Like okay. It was just that, but I knew that I needed to register as a business to, to deduct expenses right, sure. and stuff that I would be incurring. Little did I know how many expenses I'd be incurring over the next <laughs> 10 years at that point, right? Because I, I, you know, I didn't even know about the, the studio I was going to sure. move into eventually. But in the apartment, you know, I had plans to do like I, I had a proposal for an eight, a half inch eight track analog deck and some more gear and some microphones and just uh, a, still a small setup, but enough to um, work out of the apartment. So that was kind of cool. And I didn't have to go anywhere. The commute was like walking to my door, <laughs> the apartment, you know, so. So, th so that was pretty bold. I mean, you know, so you're still a young kid when you graduate, right? You're 21, 22 years old, yeah. right? And there's probably other opportunities that you could have taken. Uh, I, I assume some of the kids that you went to school with probably went off to more established studios. Or right, yeah. Some of them went right away stations. to New York or LA or whatever. You know, they just dove right in. Some, some of the students that were like really like, you know, aggressive, like just went right for it. But they all went working for other people, right? And you decided yeah. to go off on your own. What what gave you the incentive to do that? I did have a, a, a day job for a little bit at uh, Ticketron, which became Ticketmaster, and then they laid everybody off. So I'd already started my studio when I got laid off of that gig. That was just a short time. I was, it was my first full-time job after sure. college. That job actually, you know, it, it was not a good job. But um, one thing I say about, uh, always, like, no matter what job you're working, you know, it could be the the lousiest job and you might not like it, but you always want to be the best employee mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because an example of that is I worked this, you know, this job at, at it was still Ticketron at the time. And my boss was kind of, he was an actor, sure. you know, like that was his thing outside of job of his job. So he was kind of artistic and stuff, but no one really liked him. And he was always in his office playing like, you know, solitaire or sure. chess on the computer sure. or something. And everyone's afraid to go in and talk to him. And, 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 you know, I was always like, on time and I did my job. And there was a time when I needed, I applied for a loan for my first equipment sure. in the apartment. And on the on the bank loan application, I put down, I made more than I did. Mm -hmm. Cause I knew that if I put down what I make, I'm never gonna get any money. Right, so, right. and I had no credit. So after I did that and submitted the application, I went to my boss, I had to go into his office and tell him that I just applied for a loan that I might have put down a little bit more than I make and that they may be calling you and asking you to verify this. So I just mm -hmm. let you know, and then just walked out, right? Thinking, you know, I don't know what to think about this. Uh, the next day he taps me on the shoulder. I'm on the phone and he taps me on the shoulder and I say, yeah, what's up? And he's like, and he told me that the bank was on the phone and he said, they say that you are, you make this much money. And I go, that, yeah, that sounds about right. And then he turned around and he verified it with the bank. <laughs> Now, was so, it an enormous amount? Not a lot, but it was yeah. more than, it was obviously more than I made. Mm -hmm. and, but the fact is, I was a good employee. I didn't cause him any headaches. And I asked him for a small favor. Yes, he lied for me, but he didn't have, you know, it was no risk on his part, right. really. So right. the fact that he, you know, and I really appreciated that because I would not have gotten the loan had he not said I make this much money. Sure. I paid that loan off. I paid, you know, on time. It was like, I needed that head start to get the equipment I needed. So just, you know, in anything you're doing, just do it well and have people rely on you. And that way, when you need to call that, call a small favor, or sometimes big favors, I mean, this changed whether or not I was going to have a studio or not. So yeah, that one moment, right? Yeah. I mean, so was, was that kind of like a lesson about your real first big lesson about personal relationships and how yeah, that's key just to the like, success? You know, don't be a jerk to people and do your job and don't complain, don't whine about stuff. You had an apartment and it was not too far from Berkeley. It was, yeah, right and, between the and two And you said, rooms. how many months had it passed between graduation and you actually starting in your uh, apartment? Well, I'd had a four track in college. Okay. You know, so and you had the four I would track. tinker around and, mm -hmm. um, you know, spend a lot of time. Some some of it was towards, you know, try to learn how to practice better. But I did have, you know, a little four track set up. And it was six months later that I actually registered as a business. Sure. Okay. But I still had a four track. Right. And then I, because yeah, I'm I wanted interested to. interested in like the first pieces of equipment that 
that you found? Yeah, it was mostly just like, uh, you know, about halfway through Berkeley, I bought a Tascam 234 cassette, re- you know, four track. Uh, okay. Yeah. And it ran, the big thing about it was it ran at twice the speed. So you, it's <laughs> like, yeah, but it's still a cassette. It's still like this thin of tape, right? Yeah. But, you know, I did a lot of work on the four track and uh, it was not an ideal sure, outcome. Sure. It was very frustrating. Just like when, you know, you get your first guitar, it's not really that great of a guitar. So you're frustrated just trying to make it sound right. When you record yourself, you're able to evaluate how you play and, and what it sounds like and you, you get to be better. So I tell my, my, you know, when I was given guitar lessons, I would just tell them, just record yourself and you'll be able to uh, hear what you're doing because you can't hear what you're doing as you're playing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like bands think they're awesome because they're, they're jamming out and they're feeling it. But then if you really actually take a recording of that rehearsal, it's just not good at all, <laughs> you know? So, and you know, and that just happens. I mean, because you're, you're so excited. You're just not as agile as you would be Mm-hmm. with uh you know event down the line sure. as a session player you know session players know exactly what to do and right, right and how to play it you set up a recording studio in your apartment in your bedroom yeah so does this what did he do did he put stuff all over the walls for soundproofing or? yeah i had like you know the egg crate stuff in the ceiling you know there was carpet on the floor my roommate's room had carpet and we would use his room for some of the recording uh, you know where the mics were, but we we drilled the hole through the wall so we could feed cables through so instead of going around and all that. So, uh-huh. you know, so we kind of modified it and put I put some electrical in that I probably shouldn't have done. And um, yeah, so, so was, you're in a two two bedroom apartment yeah, with small. your roommate who's also into audio. And yep, he went to Berkeley. Yeah, yeah. And you're drilling holes through the wall in order to run wires. Yeah. Are you using one room as kind of like a control room? Or? Well, my bedroom was the control room and I would typically <laughs> record vocals and stuff in there. But the, you know, if I was going to do a band, uh-huh. uh, the drum had to be in the other room. And so, you know, we'd plan it when my roommate was working. He worked in the MIDI labs at Berkeley, or the okay. computer uh, synth labs. And uh, so he would be at work and we would take his bed, put it up against the window and put the drum kit in there and run oh, the cables man. through the wall. That's, that's unplug the fish tank. Who are your neighbors? You know, um, Berkeley students, so mostly, yeah. mostly, but you know, um, I don't know why they didn't call the police on us because we were always re- playing or recording something, but they mm-hmm. were playing too. So, your first set of clients were uh, hip hop, rap. A lot of them were. Well, hip hop wasn't even a thing yet. It wasn't. It was just called rap, you know, and. Uh, I did some jazz stuff and some folky stuff, but then a lot of my clients, I would say about 80% of my projects were these rappers that had lyrics and they had ideas about music and they would bring in cassettes or records and we would try to sample some stuff or I'd play riffs. Um, now this is night around 88, early 90s? Uh, this would be probably 90 to 95. So that, by the way, that's my favorite time in hip hop. Oh yeah? Um, it was a great time. It was post Run DMC, but you right. know, Tribe Called Quest was right. was coming up. We had it's little post De La Soul. Yeah, but but I wasn't doing much of that. I was right. doing more hardcore rap. Like right. The well, guys so that was that the other thing that was popular. So the New York thing. Yeah. You know, New, you know, my friends in New York were working with, like I know one of my friends, close friends, Angela. She was working with like Naughty by Nature and that scene. And you know, she worked with Tupac, things like that. So so my friends that went to New York were working with people like Tupac. You mm-hmm. know, and those. Sure. You know, big kind of emerging artists and, you know, the whole, uh, you know, that whole thing was was big in New York. Mm-hmm. But I was doing more like local hardcore rap. Well, that was, that was the other trend during the time, because I, I feel like the early to mid 90s, it, there was, you know, you had the jazz rap kind of jazz infusion. You had hardcore kind of gangster rap that was yeah, I did a lot of that. Time. Yeah, I did a lot of that. That yeah. was what I was doing. I was like. <laughs> Like, I can't play this for my mom, you know, like, <laughs> you know, so, um, but it was intense. And I'd play some stuff for friends of mine. They're like, you know, it was right. like a drum machine, with like a really kind of clunky, you know, it wasn't even like 808 kind of mm-hmm. thing. It was just like, you know, I had like a rolling drum machine. It wasn't really that much of a rap thing, but we did right. samples and, you know, we, we put things together with various elements, but. Um, was it hard? Now, do you have to relate to the music in order to do a good recording? Well, in some ways, I mean, you just kind of have to, I mean, back then it was just too simple. There wasn't much to talk mm. about. They just wanted loops and patterns. And then I would play some riffs or bass lines or keyboard parts, things like that. I would actually add things to the thing that I, the reason why these guys came to me, or I was, you know, the, the people that I retained as clients was that I was able to take their ideas. I was, first of all, I was 20 bucks an hour. So that was pretty, you know, pretty sure. affordable. Um, 
I was able to take whatever they gave me. They gave me a cassette or a record. Mm -hmm. I would sample it. We would do some stuff with it. I could play guitar riffs. Now, back then, you could sample pretty openly, right? I mean, yeah, it wasn't that easy to do. It was like, you know, I had a Roland sampler and it was hard to, you'd have to find the right key. Right. And, you know, but, it was. Well, I, actually, I was talking a little bit more about copyright and. People were sampling everything. Yeah, and then the, no one was talking copyrights back then. You know? Right. So and, was, and I didn't have any stake in the song, so I didn't right. care. They paid me for my time. Here's your song. Right, right. And right. whatever happens to you, I will visit you in jail if you get, you know, <laughs> if you get infringed upon or right. whatever, caught by whoever. Um, like Paul's Boutique was uh, the BC Boys, yeah. Paul's Boutique, which is almost kind of like the Sergeant Peppers of of yeah. hip hop or rap. Um, yeah, I mean, I was doing stuff they like that. Every yeah, and, it was and, amazing. And, you know, I mean, my clients were not. My, my clients were more street. They weren't as mm -hmm. like, like Beastie Boys to me was not the kind of thing I was doing. I liked them, but it right. wasn't, it, I was kind of doing some other, some, you know, the hardcore stuff. It wasn't something I could play. I would never, mm -hmm. I was never going to hear when I was recording this stuff, I knew it was never going to be on the radio because sure. it's sure. like, you know, I could catch my breath after I listened to the lyrics. Like, whoa. But, but the thing I learned about that. Now, um, were you ever scared by any of your clients? By I way? was, yes. I was scared many times. Yeah, <laughs> I was. So okay. is your, uh, they were, you... they were packing sometimes and I knew it because I looked around and be like, what, what? The guy was like cleaning his gun or something. And I'm like, and you know, I'm like engineering and every once in a while I go. And these guys are in your room. They're I mean, in my they're bedroom. Literally yeah. in your bedroom. Yeah. Like five guys that I don't really know nice. and me. And I have headphones on with my back to everybody. It was just kind of, it was a little, it was a little unnerving at times. But what I did soon realize that put me at ease was that in that moment, you were in like a neutral zone. Right, right. And it was really freaky. I realized that early on that we were not the same kind of, like mm -hmm. on the street, we would be different factions, right? Sure, sure. And the studio is mm -hmm. a, a neutral zone. And uh, I, I learned that they appreciated what I was doing for them. Sure. And so I felt more comfortable, you know, with like when they would bring people by that I wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. But we were making music and I think that that um, they appreciate what I was doing for them. And there was no hostilities or, you know, like, right, right. you know, I, I felt comfortable with them very shortly after we started working on a project. It was sure. it was very uh, apparent that things were you know, neutral. So, mm -hmm. so I, I enjoyed it for me. It was more diff more challenging because of the sampling and the MIDI stuff. And I was syncing to a tape machine, you know, yeah. so I was locking to tape. Sure. And so I, it was challenging for me, as opposed to a guy that just comes in with an acoustic guitar and sings vocals, like the folk people that came in were easy to record because they just set up, a, I set up a couple of mics and hit record and I'm not doing anything. Right? Sure. They're performing and they're doing everything, but which I did some of that too. Those are so much easier those were a lot easier than the projects that had to deal with MIDI and synchronizing to tape and things like mm -hmm. that. So, so I learned a lot when I started losing projects because a band couldn't afford me and another studio, mm -hmm. you know, the bands that I couldn't record in my small studio, I had some people want me to work with them and, but they said, well, we can't pay you. Uh, we can, we can barely pay for the studio time. We can't pay you, but we'd like you to record us and produce us. And, mm -hmm. and I couldn't do it. Cause I just, I mean, I just couldn't, do it for nothing. And I kind of sensed that I was starting to lose some, some jobs. I had, I did have a studio I could go to. Two friends of mine had a studio in Watertown that I would go to and record some projects, but it was just inconvenient. And then one day they canceled my session the day of the session. Oh man. That's and I, hard. that's when I said, I got to have my own place because I can't, I, I lost that. I lost an album project because that was the basic session of a band. And I had to call them like just hours before the session, uh, and had to cancel. Mm -hmm not because I wanted to, but because the the people that own the studio wanted to rehearse that night with their band. Ah, and that was the catalyst for you to go to your next location, which was where? Uh, Kingston Street in Chinatown, Boston. Okay. Yeah. And this was what, uh, toward late 90s? It was 95, 95. middle, oh, middle okay. summer of 95 yeah. was when I started that, or when I signed the lease. It took me about two years actually to look to, I it, it was a two year period of being that frustrated and knowing I needed to have my own studio. And you I, find, yeah. Because I looked at places in Kenmore and different things. And then uh, I just uh, found this really beaten up, you know, 4,000 square foot dumpy loft place in Kingston Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just in rough shape. I mean, it's a great sure. open room, but, 
you know, you're looking around and there's like, I mean, it was like a hundred years of dirt all over everything. And there was like all these fluorescent lights and the building used to be manufacturing like garment manufacturing. It was in the, what they call the leather district, you know? Okay. So there was, it was, yeah. it had a, gar a history of garment companies and you could see the the holes in the floor where the sewing machines used to be, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? So it was, it was kind of cool historically, but it was nasty. It was filthy and dirty and, and, uh, you know, where there were like just things like, do I, can I take this out without you know, setting off a fire alarm or it's just, you know, sure. there's just stuff sure. everywhere that you want to try to clean up and construction was six, took six months. So when now you're in this new location, you probably built up a, what, a clientele? So you, you not haven't... enough, not enough. Okay. That was you... my problem. So I built this place. Yeah. And, and how then... did it look when it first opened? Was it, you know, were, did you have to get a console at that time and all uh, of that? Or? I used the same board I had yeah. and I upgraded a little bit. I got a new computer, but it wasn't that much of an upgrade. Mm -hmm. But I just, I had no money to really upgrade the gear. Right. But the space right. was good and I had more band projects. Like, I, you know, that was one of the things that I wanted to do is do more bands because we could play live right, and, sure, and sure. stuff. And uh, that did increase, but not enough. I mean, sure. I was like, it just was not filling the time. Right. At all. It was so scary. you're getting it over your head real quick. Then, Way huh? over my head. Yeah. And I knew I was. I was actually supposed to have a photographer rent the space with me initially, and he bailed mm -hmm. out uh, early, early okay. in the process. His parents didn't support him to do it. And I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And so mm -hmm. my, my philosophy at that time was if you jump into the fire, someone will help you. you mm -hmm. know? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. you have to show initiative. You, right. you can't go up to people and say, you know, woe is me. I can't do this because I don't have any money. And it's like, I wasn't going to stay in that kind of space. I was going to do it. I was going to go in over my head and then people were going to go, whoa, did he just do that? Like, All is right. he building the studio? Is he, you know, and then I started needing help, mm -hmm. like really serious financial help to keep it going. And people believed in me enough because they saw me do it mm -hmm. that because I had a lot of friends help me with the painting and spackling and you know so a lot right. of people earned uh studio time for their mm -hmm. so i didn't pay them i just we just had a log and every day they'd sign out and i said okay we're five hours today and sure we kept track of that and i uh was able to you know record several projects for them are you musicians work. good spacklers in general they can be but yeah, yeah. it's like they, they slack <laughs> off a little bit too much so it's yeah. like, but it was just such a massive undertaking it was a right. it was a huge four thousand square foot space and everything needed to be painted and so the paint was literally still wet during the opening you know, reception that we had sure. that December. It was like six That's months later. It was like, uh, don't touch the walls, they're still wet, you know. So so that was something that was just last minute. We just everything, you know, worked out. And it was there for five years. So, so what what type of bands were your clients at that time? You said you started doing a little bit more rock. Yeah, I mean all kinds really. Um ska was kind of, I'm trying to think like yeah, I did, some ska. Ska I did was kind of uh Steady Earnest. Resurgent. You know Steady Earnest? Sure. Yeah. Um because uh Dan Vitale from Bim Scala Bim was the singer in Steady Earnest and my friend Jack Sherman, who was one of the spacklers, he's yeah. on the spackling team. He had earned some some money, sure. you know, some time for for that. So he decided to use his time for to record a steady earnest project. And I think they, you know, he probably paid for most of it mm -hmm. with that time. So they mm -hmm. didn't have to pay much at all. So that was good because then I could get bands. You know, I, I would never have done steady earnest if I if Jack, you know, didn't have some free, free studio time. So it opened up some doors for bands, but like the ska stuff we did some rock stuff. Another friend of mine earned some electrician friend earned some time for his band and they did like really kind of crazy, you know, punk kind of, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. It was, it was, it was pretty cool stuff. It was like rock and uh, it's like hard rock, but kind of punky. So, right. and they would do, they actually had a show, a, a music showcase mm -hmm. one night at the studio. Cause it was such a big place that we could have events there too, mm -hmm. to hopefully my, you know, I was trying to promote the studio so we would have art exhibits, we'd have music showcasing, and it never really took off. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it was just it was it was just a, a lot of work. You know, having a show, oh, let's have a show. People will see the studio, sure, and then they'll sure. just like want to do projects, and it didn't happen because they just wanted to party. And then, you know, they had a great time. I wasn't having that great of a time because as a as the proprietor of the establishment, you know, you're kind of like, right, you know, and anything that was going on was probably something that could get me evicted. So mm -hmm. you know, because they, you know they're not really you're not really there to have a party at your space you know the mm -hmm. landlords were very right. hardcore so it was it was challenging to kind of try to balance the uh, exposing people to the studio but yet not getting evicted sure. because of it you know so yeah. so you were there for five years yep. and then you went to your final location yep which is your current north, location in north quincy yeah in north yep. quincy right yep so after the five-year lease was up they didn't renew it and i had to find a place in 60 days and 
So I scrambled and I found a place in North Quincy. We have a, a, a room probably about the size of this room almost mm -hmm. um, as a recording room. So it's definitely big enough for doing you know sure. bands and stuff like I want. But you know if you're not utilizing that space, it's just you know it's just hard to fill a room every day with that recording. Sure. When I do a lot of programming or singer songwriter stuff, where you don't really need a large room, yeah. you know. So, but it it does uh, come in handy for for you know recording drums or ensembles or things like that. Sure. You mentioned there was a, you had a there was a fire in one of your locations. Was that at the, one, yeah. the one the new one? The yeah, one in the, North the latest Quincy. one. Yeah, yeah. When was, was now? How long ago was that? Uh, the early two thousands, like you know, several years after I moved in. So Did your whole place burn to the no, ground? No, the, or the what? back unit was set on fire. So they put it out. Luckily, there's a fire department like mm -hmm. just down the street that, um, and somebody was living next door in the other unit. Luckily, was were they living. okay? They were okay, but they were, they're the one that called the fire department. Okay. No one was there. Uh, then it would have it would have burned to the ground. Yeah, yeah. So, but your and your location was didn't wasn't affected. It was affected. I was okay. I got severe smoke damage. Um, the space wasn't burned, but it was, uh, it was just an odd occurrence. I just left the studio. It was late at night. And, and I mean, like I left at like one 30 in the morning and at like two 30, I get a call that there's a fire at my building. And when I get to the building, there's like, you know, fire engines and mm -hmm. police cars and all kinds of stuff. And I get to my front door and the door had been pried open. So I go, like, Oh geez, oh, what's man. going on? And I opened the studio and it was all smoke. So the fire had been in the back unit, but they had to get in the front. They were, you know, they come at it from different angles and sure. stuff. So I, by them prying the door open, I got a lot of smoke damage uh, and that was a whole issue. So I, I always say, always have insurance on your stuff. People go too long without having any gear insurance, you know, mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, it's like, I don't need to quit. I don't need to have this, but you know, insurance seems like a waste of money until you need it. All the, call it all the plagues of audio, so like fire, theft. You know, yeah, you didn't tell us about the theft. What happened? You just in the apartment days, I had somebody kind of, they broke into the apartment and, you know, they were actually like rummaging through my stuff when I came home <laughs> and uh, they had kind of jimmied the door so I couldn't open it right away and um, had they had to jump out the window. Um, I didn't see them. They had just jumped out the window prior to me opening the door. Mm -hmm. But luckily I caught them before they were able to grab stuff. So nothing got taken, but just... At that point, that's when I knew I had to get a burglar alarm. I've had, you know, an alarm ever since after that happened. So, wow, yeah, okay, that's pretty scary. Luckily, I didn't have anything other than my Les Paul, which would have been pretty devastating to have that taken. But, you know, I was before I had a lot of stuff. I had a four track and things, but, you know, they were all going to get so much if you know, like, you can only mm -hmm. carry so much stuff out, you know, like, you know, without looking suspicious, you know. Sure. But uh, luckily, I came home and I did so. So, I, you've been doing this now for thirty years. Yep. You've survived theft. You've survived a fire. You said it was before you moved to the North Quincy during the Kingston Street, Kingston Street days. The finances were a bear. Bad, yeah. Um, but that's not uncommon. You know, the main thing about the business is you're, you know, I guess first and foremost, because of the business, you're a studio owner. Sure. So you have to manage the studio or you don't have a place to do your thing. I mean, I knew how beneficial it was for me to have a studio in my bedroom. Right, right. And then become a commercial, you know, I mean, become a studio, registered studio, so I could start, you know, the tax benefits and stuff. But just having the ability to have that set up, which a lot of people have now, you mm -hmm. know. So mm -hmm. the benefit of these people that have setups is that's great. You have that set up to do pre-production and to write. But what some younger people don't kind of understand is that that's only the first step of the production. Like, mm -hmm. Working on a laptop is great, and there's a lot you can do with it. But at some point, you have to go to a larger room, sure, it whatever kind of studio it is, and just move some air mm -hmm. because a lot of this stuff, you know, I mean, I'm big into programming and technology and stuff like that. But you also have to understand that you need to incorporate acoustics and you know, like microphone techniques so that you can capture real instruments and have like you know the emotion and you know, people come in with with instruments. You got to be able to record them. So sure, it's not just about recording everything in the box. So that's the one thing that. I see happening a lot of times with, with the music now is that they're not using, they don't know how to use a microphone mm -hmm. or they have one USB mic and that's all they use, but they're not aware of like the benefit of having multiple mics, recording in a room, using preamps, the benefit of some higher end gear on your input struct, uh, mm -hmm. you know, input chain. Um, you know, just having one excellent mic and one excellent preamp 
is going to be so much better than just plugging a USB mic into your laptop. Sure, you know? sure. So that's the kind of thing that I try to impart to my students, uh, even adult students, the Berkeley Online thing is a, they don't have much gear and, and you can do a lot with it, but you want to understand, okay, this is only this portion of the production process. Sure. And, you know, having a room for me has been beneficial just recording a guitar amp or, yeah. you know, a drum kit or a string section instead of just relying completely on the virtual instruments that come, you know, in the computer. So sure. every mad scientist needs a laboratory. You sure. know what I mean? So it's like if you're not if the only time you're in a studio is when you're paying for that studio time, mm -hmm. you're not in there enough. Mm -hmm. You can't be in there enough because you can't afford it. So sure. to have a setup you know, a small little rig that you can do uh, your work, you know, you can, you can experiment, conduct, conduct your experiments of, you know, does this work or whatever. You, you don't experiment in, in the studio if you're paying for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Being a studio owner, I do have a lot of expenses every month just maintaining a studio, but I never worry about how long something's going to take me to work on my own song, or I, I can craft things as I want, or I can spend extra time on client projects without having to charge them for that time because i'm not paying somebody i'm just not you know i'm not adding to their bill and once i pay you know once my rent and everything gets paid it's like you know you have a fixed amount of expenses so as long as i can cover that i try to go out of my way a little bit at times to help clients uh because i want it to sound right and sure. you know especially in the mixing stage if somebody's going to record an album with me and pay me to mix it and the mixing isn't quite done to my satisfaction or their satisfaction, I start to kind of, the, the expenses start to go down a little bit. I, I don't charge them for the full rate mm -hmm. at the very tail end because I know, you know, they've paid me for mixing. So at some point you just got to say, okay, this is on me because I want it to sound a certain way. Sure. So I'm able to cut some hours to their benefit and they realize that. And that's, mm -hmm. it's like customer service mm -hmm. stuff, you know, mm -hmm. where people know that you're, you're, especially at the tail end where they're really hurting for their budget, right? Like sure. they, they spent everything and they're just like trying to like, you know, here's a hundred here, hundred there, whatever. But if you can help them by just, you know, making, you know, the, the product finished, they appreciate that. And then they come back and that, that's sure. how you build that customer bond, you know? No, so. but you've been doing this for, for 30 years mm -hmm. and throughout a, a big portion of it was, was very challenging where your margins were thin, if, if any. Well, yeah, times, there's many right? years I didn't make a profit. So, But then now, all of a sudden, yeah. I mean, not all of a sudden, yeah. but recently, it seems like uh, from what you've been telling me. And, yeah, and it's, it's changed. It's it, changed. It's, it's almost of taking off for you where you have clients that are trying to, you know, you don't have enough time to serve all the clients that want to work with you. You just put on a master class, which is right. fascinating. Right. Uh, and, I, and I want to ask you about that in just a minute. Yeah. You're teaching and yeah. seems like, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I think about uh, comedians sometimes that have worked for 15 years and then all of a sudden on the, the 16th year, the 17th year, right. all, all the stars come in alignment and they just take off. And yeah. is that the traditional trajectory of uh, someone that does yeah, what you it do. Takes a long time, yeah. Um, this year, um, I've had more diversified projects. So sure. a lot of my work now is not necessarily just sitting in my own studio working with people. Now, over so, the last several years, have you done a lot of rock and roll? Are you still doing hip hop, or you, you know a little bit of everything, but a little bit of everything. mainly singer songwriter stuff. Just okay. working with people, refining their song. You know, people that don't have a band. Mm -hmm. I'll program some stuff, play some stuff. We'll hire some people to come in and track, you know, overdubs. What do you enjoy most? Or is there any particular genre that you enjoy recording more than others? I'm not, you know, like I don't have a preference really. Yeah. It's like, I just, what's cool about being a producer engineer is that you learn to kind of be unbiased about music. Mm -hmm. I mean, on one hand, it takes some of the fun out of it in a way that you're, it's your job. So, sure. you, you know, you don't have to like the song. Mm -hmm. Your job is to make the song better. Have you ever been blown away by, you know, you start recording someone you just didn't expect a certain type of music to come out of an instrument yeah, yeah, or a mouth or kind no, of No, a couple times, yeah. Shocked. I remember years ago, I worked with this band. It was a, I guess it was a blues band. It was like, what was it, like Three Brothers? Mm -hmm. And there was this one little kid. He was in the band and mm -hmm. I, I didn't even know it. The parents came. It was like a, it was like the Partridge family almost, but <laughs> like a blues band. Yeah. And there was this kid that was sitting on the couch the whole time when we were tracking. He wasn't, he wasn't doing any music. His brothers were playing uh, drums, bass, and guitar. Yeah. 
And he was just sitting on the couch, you know, with a coloring book or something, right? The father, who was kind of like their manager at the time, after we cut the, the, the tracks, I think we only cut two songs, then said, oh, we're going to do a harmonic overdub. I'm like, oh, cool. All right. So I got a mic set up, and, and then this kid steps up. Sure. Little kid. He's like, yeah. you know, 10 years old or something. The father goes, check this out. And then the kid gets on this harmonica, and I'm just like, and I, and they're like, yeah, blown away. I was like, 10 year old kid on the a guy harmonica. sounded like, I mean, he was just like wailing, said no, you know, he's like, in, you know, coloring book. And all of a sudden the guy's just like playing like an amazing harmonica. And that made the band. I mean, that, that was like, they had decent songs, but this kid was there. Like <laughs> it was, what it was, was in, Dean, what was the name of the band? What was, do you remember? Uh, uh, I can't remember the name. It was the the, the one of the brothers was the guitar player sure. singer. His name is Clay, but I think I can't yeah. remember the name of them. But it's a Clay something band. Mm -hmm. And so I record these guys, and like a couple months later, I saw him on the Jerry Lewis Telethon. Oh no, kidding! You know when, when yeah. that used to be on whatever yeah, years yeah. ago. And, but I was like, there he is. I just recorded those guys, yeah. and the kid was like. Wah! You know, now, how do you record a, a harmonica? Do you, do you put the mic? I mean, in, in a live performance, right? They always put the harmonica right on the mic, right? Typically, what I'd prefer to do with a harmonica is you, you play the harmonica into the, there's a harmonica mic that's mm -hmm. kind of like that bullet looking kind of mic where you can yes. hold it and play. Mm -hmm. And that typically, the best way to get a sound out of that is for that to go into a, into a guitar amp. And then you mic the guitar amp. No kidding. That's how you get that. Now, do you record, what do they call it, the recording dry? Or do you record that I'd, coming in and then do you ever... Uh, I didn't for that probably, but I would now. I, I would yeah. record a DI and then through the through the amp. Sure. I would now. now. How this often was, do you reamp recordings? Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on what we're capturing when we're doing it. But I always record a DI. Mm -hmm. Now, for people that don't know, what is a DI? Uh, it's, a, it's a box uh, for, it's called direct injection. It just allows mm -hmm. the guitar or bass or keyboard... You know any kind of line level instrument um, mm -hmm. to go directly into the mixer it's a pretty cool thing because the di box does a lot of it, it converts a lot of things so you've got your guitar cable right so you can't plug a guitar cable into mic input mm -hmm. you know so there's things that a di box does to convert your impedance you know guitar cable is high impedance to low impedance mm -hmm. which means that you can run a longer cable from that point on uh converts the jack from you know quarter inch to xlr so sure. you can plug in the mix a lot of things like that but it allows for that that sound of the guitar itself mm -hmm. to be captured and used later for some other way, sure. you know, to, for mm -hmm. some other processing if you need it. Mm -hmm. And then you record the amp, and that's you know maybe you like it, maybe you don't. If you don't like the amp sound, then you've got the actual out of the guitar, sure, complete sure. direct line from the guitar itself, and you can manipulate that, put it through a different amp, or layer it with the amp you used, mm -hmm. or use the direct through a through plug-in so it just gives you options right i describe an amp as an instrument would that be a correct way to you know because it is almost an instrument in that way right because you're miking the amp you're putting a microphone in front of the amp so in some ways well i would consider well, that not as much the instrument because the instrument would be like the source the guitar mm -hmm. the bass the okay. keyboard whatever, whatever but the amp it would be more of a signal processor okay because you can do things to it to alter the sound. So for right. me, like an amp is not an instrument. I mean, it could be a continuation of the instrument. It's a package of here's sure. the guitar and here's the amp, but that as a whole could be the instrument. But mm -hmm. to me, a, an amp is, because it changes the sound so drastically mm -hmm. and you have options, to me, I think of an amp as a processor sure. of sound. So you know, there's a lot of options you can do with that. Mm -hmm. And different amp, every amp has a different sound, every guitar has a different sound, so it definitely, it's good to get the uh, direct sound because you can use it later. If right. something, because I've had it, uh, there was one uh, project I recorded where, you know, I recorded a DI and recording the amp and I wasn't quite happy with the amp, but he came back a second day, we we're recording some more guitar sounds. I'm like, is that the same sound you had the other day? Because mm -hmm. it just sounds so thin. It's like, yep, same settings, whatever. And I'm like, all right. So we recorded like three or four songs. Right. And the fourth song, he goes to play a solo. He's like, okay, I'm going to play a solo on this one now. And then he, he, he has a, this big pedal board and he's like, oh my God, I've had my wah pedal on the whole time, mm. which is why the sound was thin mm -hmm. because he had the wah mm. pedal on and a certain like all the mm -hmm. way down thin sound and didn't know it. Mm -hmm. And everyone looked at each other like, oh, oh no, because he was just, he was just almost so done. His hands, he'd been playing right. all afternoon, right? So his hands were just 
like he was almost done for the day sure, right and he was sure. just so like oh i'm like don't worry we're we've got the di man it wasn't the, yeah. it wasn't his part that was bad it was the sound that was bad so right. all we did was take the the amp uh, the uh, direct sound and reamp it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so he could just sit there so he right. when he's done we said okay no worries just sit there no we'll worries. just right because you had a copy you recorded both right we recorded, recorded his performance mm -hmm. so that's the benefit of recording di right. is the, the the performance is there and then you can spend time uh working on the sound or in this case saving the sound um mm -hmm. And uh, and then what I did after the fact was I took that same, those same guitar parts and I ran it through my amp mm -hmm. because they were thin. I didn't like the sound of his amp as much on its own. Right. And it was a one guitar band. So what I did, and they were like, oh, I don't think we, you know, early on and we were talking about reamping and stuff. Like, no, nah, I think our sound will be fine and whatever. It wasn't fine. They just mm -hmm. didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I spent about six hours one day. I set up my amp and I just blew all their tracks through it and recorded it over every single track. Because every song had like four guitar parts or something. Sure, so I just sure. recorded everything through my amp and layered it with the original guitar sound. Mm -hmm. And they were blown away. So that yeah. extra six hours that day yeah. helped them. But it was for me mm -hmm. to sound like so right. the project sounded better. And they could tell how much better it sounded. Mm -hmm. So so the DI box really helped in mm -hmm. that case save the project. So it's it's really good to have uh, options sure. you know, when you're trying to work on finishing something. You just got back from Connecticut from a masterclass. It was the first one that you did, but it was a wild success. Yeah. You told me a little bit about it. It sounded amazing. Walk me through the genesis of it and what the class was about. A couple of years ago, Avatar Studios, which used to be the power station in New York, it was Avatar from about 96, 95, 96 or so till just uh, about two years ago. And, sure, uh, was that right in Manhattan? Yep. Yeah. And so Avatar was, you know, pretty successful, but they were, they were trying to sell the studio. They were trying to just, not that they weren't doing well. I just think it was one of those things where like the owner kind of had enough, mm -hmm. you know, he just was kind of looking to just not do this anymore for whatever reason. He, uh, Kirk Imamura was the, with the owner of Avatar and he didn't want to sell it for development things. Sure. You know, like, so he, he wanted to keep it a studio. So, but when Avatar got bought out with a number of investors, one of which was Berkeley, the studio manager, Tino, who had been doing that for a number of years, didn't really have a gig. Mm -hmm. So I saw some LinkedIn posts that he posted. I actually reached out to him one day and I said, you know, would you be interested in working on some educational workshops is what we were kind of calling it at the time. Mm -hmm. I knew he knew people. I knew people, he knew people. And I thought with his promotional experience, you know, as a, as a, as a studio manager and my educational background, we could put together something that would be a good offering, a good opportunity for people to learn something from people that have had great success in the industry. Sure. So it turns out that he was friends with Neil Dorfsman, who he'd worked with a lot in his Avatar days. Who among, is Neil Dorfsman? Another, uh, among other people. But um, so Neil has had success uh, with a number of, of people. His first commercial recording as, a, as an engineer was Bruce Springsteen's The River. Sure. That's so, amazing. And that was like, that kind of took Bruce off into a new, mm -hmm. you know, he was okay at the time but like i think the river was um you know one of those and that's when he kind of started to mm -hmm. skyrocket a little bit more and more and more until he got you know to where he is now neil recorded the river which was a very big success he recorded you know the the hungry uh, hungry heart song mm -hmm. that was one of the, the hits on that album he recorded i mean uh, so many other people but you know he had paul mccartney sting but his big the big one for me when i saw his discography was the dire straits brothers in arms album yes because in 1985, album. I was a freshman at Berkeley, and that, obviously that was a big uh, money for nothing. Was a huge hit, and it was sure. like you know Live Aid and all that kind of stuff. So, so Neil recorded. Uh, actually, he was the producer, and he did some recording on it. But it was a big hit for him. So he recorded that, and then just all these other things that he's done because he was working at the power station at the time. Okay. And prior to that, he worked with Eddie Kramer. He he kind of started in elect at Electric Lady, which was Jimi Hendrix Studio. He started there and then went to Power Station quickly thereafter and, and just had a bunch of really big, you know, big and just not so big projects, but he just was working very steadily. So he's had a lot of experience and one of his big things was recording drums. So okay. we attempted and pulled off doing a master class about drum miking and mixing mm -hmm. at Power Station New England, which is basically a replica of this Power Station studio. Right. It's an um, unbelievable yeah. studio. It's right? crazy, right? And so, I'm going to have to, we'll put a picture yeah. of it. No, it's crazy. So it's what, what makes it unbelievable? Well, 
the, the, the freakiest thing is, you know, for, especially for someone like Neil, who worked at the power station in New York, is that it's the same studio. Like it's the, an exact he replica. bought the, the owner of, of power station, New England, they, they, it's Sonalist is the name of the company. And they have, all sure. the, they have some sound stages there. The plans to the original power station were purchased because Tony Bon Jovi was the designer of the original power station. And I think it, Tony I Bon Jovi, Bon Jovi's brother, Tony. No, it's, it's no. actually their cousin. So, oh, their cousin. Yeah, okay. John Bon Jovi used to work at the power station because his okay. cousin was the owner and built right. or whatever. So that's how he got, I, I just, you know, I, I assumed it's it was the same related bon Jovi, to Bon Jovi. I don't know right, any other same bon kind of New Jersey Bon Jovi family, sure. but, okay. um, <laughs> But yeah, Tony Bon Jovi is, a, is an amazing, like, brainiac kind of guy. He designed mm -hmm. this place from just laws of physics and acoustics. And he said, okay, this ceiling, and he talks really, like, he talks like this, he's like, I really thought, it was, you know, he's like, this really kind of, yeah. almost, he reminds me of uh, Joe Pesci kind of thing. Right, okay. But, but more yeah. Joe Pesci than even Joe Pesci. Okay. He, he has a background in Motown. He went, to, when he was 16 years old, he worked at Motown. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he knew things, and he built this studio, and I think he was, he owned the plans, even though the, the studio, I think, went into receivership for some reason. He sold these plans to somebody, and so they built the exact same studio in mm -hmm. Connecticut. That's the freakiest thing, is you walk in, and there's this humongous studio that looks just like the studio in New York, because I've been there several times. And so for somebody that works there, like Neil had worked there for many years, he thought it was a really weird experience, because mm -hmm. we asked him, like, what's it like to be in here? And he's like, it, it's, it's, it's exactly weird, replica, because you, right? it, you walk out, and you're expecting to be on a new New York street and you walk sure. out and you're in the middle of nowhere. Cause right. you know, it's like, it's a, it's a big complex of, of buildings. Yeah, where, where in Connecticut is it? It's Waterford, Connecticut. Waterford. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we had this event. We hired a professional drummer to come in and, and play. Who was that? Uh, his name was Doug Yowell. And uh, he played, he was just on tour this summer with uh, Joe Jackson. Mm -hmm. And he's been on tour with uh, okay. Suzanne Vega. He's a touring drummer, but a session drummer. It was just amazing. I mean, for me, I had the, first of all, for me, it was just like, I didn't have to pay for it because I was the one organizing it, right? So sure, for me, I sure. was able to learn for practically well, nothing. So, so. That, that confuses me a bit. You are Yoda level of an audio engineer at this point in your career. What in the hell did you learn just recently? Well, I mean, I'm, I guess I shouldn't be surprised, I'm right? I'm not You're even, always... no, but there's like, there's people that are so much more knowledgeable. You, uh, well, first of all, you're always a student. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I've, you know, I haven't been in school. Well, I mean, I took a master's degree in like 2007, but I mean, you know, I'm not in a physical school and I'm a teacher, sure. I'm an educator, but the teacher, just because you're a teacher doesn't mean you know everything. Right. No, um, I know. But, but, but you're, you're, there's always somebody that you can, I mean, you can learn something from everybody, not just people that have been in the business, but you can learn somebody from, mm -hmm. you know, how people learn things from kids and they, you know, they, you, you know, whatever. So there's always somebody to be in the industry that has experience, more experience than you do that sure. you can learn from and who's willing to share it. So I found that a lot of guys in the industry, what we call veterans, you mm -hmm. know, that have had some huge success and maybe are kind of winding down with their careers just because of, they're just not necessarily needing to be that busy anymore. Sure. You know, they select to be busy or not, or sometimes they just, sometimes people kind of go out of fashion as far as their mm -hmm. production styles or something. So. But there are a lot of people, you know, because when I was working with people with AES and, and bringing people in for, to do presentations, I realized that these guys, you know, they're not educators, so mm -hmm. they're, not, they're kind of like nervous about it, but they want to share. Mm -hmm. So my idea that I shared with Tino was that if I can approach people that are amazingly talented, mm -hmm. who maybe now have the time in their later years to, you know, to fit something in like this, to offer them the opportunity to teach a master class. Mm -hmm. We're going to pay them and we're going to offer an amazing opportunity for people that wouldn't have that opportunity if we didn't just sit down and make it work. So this master class was about recording drums. Recording and mixing drums. Recording focus and mixing on, and drums. Focus on recording it because if you don't mm -hmm. record it right, it doesn't matter. Like sure. It's hard to mix. So, so Neil has this technique that he just does, I mean, among other engineers, it's not just him, but because he's used to recording in a larger space with more options, mm -hmm. consoles and mics and stuff he does a very extensive miking of a drum kit and he had like over 20 mics on the drum kit we had actually two mic setups we had a, a large room so the big drum set with 20 it's not even a big drum set it's just a normal drum set it wasn't even like massive it was okay. just like a i don't know how many piece kit probably six piece kit so you had 20 microphones on tw over that 20 one. yeah on that over one. 20 because of the room because it's not just about the instrument it's about capturing it in the room that you're in sure which people don't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. 
as much. You know, they either don't have the space or they don't have the microphones or they don't have the console. All of those things mm -hmm. matter, you know, or the skill set to record it properly. Sure. So that's what the, the focus was, is recording drums with from somebody who has had experience recording. His sound is, is kind of a, something that he's really proud of. And sure. he enjoys the drums more than anything as far as the recordings. You, know, you had mentioned that there were a couple techniques or some things that were a little bit new to you or not necessarily new, but... Well, just, I mean, you know, just seeing how many mics he puts on the kit and it makes sense what he did. It's just that I don't have those kind of mics, but he had room to put mics. Typically, you know, we, we put the overheads on the drums, which is, was just common, but then he had mics on the sides of the drums, like up mm -hmm. in the air. Yeah. Then he had mics back into the room. Then he had another pair. The back pair of mics actually was facing the rear wall because the rear wall was wood. So the reflections are bouncing off the wood and then going onto the mic. Sure. So you have like a warmer reflection and mm -hmm. and because it's so far away you get this differential like sure. a delay sure because of the time difference so you know we can you know realign those things and stuff in, in the tracks so we don't want to hear that delay right. but um right. but that can get tricky and that's a something you talked about in the mixing but it's just you have to capture the sound of the instrument properly mm -hmm. and not just direct sound right and, so, um, so i mean it's, it's the, the things that were new to you were primarily because of the space and the, the magnitude of yeah of and just the way he did it and one of the things that i thought was cool that the, the thing that i i kind of maybe forgot about it wasn't like i never witnessed it but he had this little tiny really what it was was a little tiny drum machine mm -hmm. and he used this little click mm -hmm. he was basically just using this little drum machine it was a battery operated like boss sure whatever sure and he was using it just as a as a metronome mm -hmm. so i have a metronome so i'm like okay i can use that so what he did is he had this click going mm -hmm. and it wasn't like a click track or anything but what it was is it was a it was a sound source mm -hmm. and he would put it up to the mic and there was the uh, the, the power station engineer was in there you mm -hmm. know just kind of making sure that everything was being picked up so basically it was a so line it was a line check so it was checking that every mic was functioning and being right, recorded right so right well that, when you have 20 mics or over 20 mics right. <laughs> and then he would set the set the click in the like on the near the drum throne to make sure that the left and right overheads were mm -hmm. recording equally mm -hmm. and the whole time he's doing this he's recording the tracks mm -hmm. so we can go back into the control room and see the level sure and also you're checking for phase mm -hmm. so that you want all of the positive and negative um aspects of you know, like a, let's say this this uh, mic cable was wired funky, mm -hmm. and the positive signal was actually creating a negative. Sure. You know, like compression rearfactions, the plus and minusing. Think of the, the, the sound can cancel each other. Yeah, out exactly. The plus and the plus and minus a little bit of be, a sound right? has to be like if I clap my hands, the first thing I should see is a transient, mm -hmm. and not like a negative mm -hmm. impulse. Because if you're taking negative information and positive information you put together, then you're kind of Taking now, it away. there's a rule, right? Uh, there's a rule, like, you know, if you were recording an acoustic guitar and someone was, you were recording their vocals as well and you had two microphones, right? right. Now, isn't there some type of rule about the distance between microphones? Up to yeah, I mean, it, the basic rule, it's called the three to one rule. Yes. Okay. That's it. And uh, it just means that if you've got something here, something else has to be at least three times the distance so you don't have conflicting phase issues and stuff like that. But there's other issues that get more complicated With beyond drums. the three to one rule, especially sure. when you use the, you know, the 25 mic rule, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, that's a different rule. Okay. So, but yeah, you can have issues with that because of time delays and, and like, if you have two toms and you have the mics that are really close together, when mm -hmm. you hit a tom, if both microphones pick up similar information, sure, it can cancel out, it can do funky things to the sound. So you just have to be aware of it. And then this technique that he did allowed him to actually visually see what's happening with the wave, the plus and minus interaction by, by just because everything, right. when you put this, this click up to the mic, not only are we saying, okay, this is the mic I, I should be seeing level on. Right. So that, you know, your inputs mm -hmm. are all accurate. Mm -hmm. But then when you go and you look at the, at the, the tracks that were recorded, he would just leave it on for like 20 minutes and you just walk around, wow. and just do that. And then Evan would say, yeah, that's good. Next one. Oh, no kidding. That okay, long. that's, yeah, I mean, yeah. And they would just let it run. So you could go back in the control room and see that. So so that's something that, that made sense to me, but I don't use that technique, but I probably will more often now. Yeah. Like, even with less than 20 mics, it 
it's it's a good thing to see that the wow. that there's no issues with the line, mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. just the mic, but like you know all the gain stages between the mic and and the output of, sure. the, of the console. So just stuff like that, and just his concepts about where to put the mic on a cymbal or where to put the mic on a snare drum. He used multiple mics on the snare. He did like three mics on the snare. One was wow. above, one was below, and then he taped like a lavalier mic to right near the rim. He called it the rim mic. <laughs> So, so you're able to have the interaction of these three mics to create the right snare drum sound. And what did the final, what did the mix sound? I mean, did it sound amazing when you were able? Yeah, to... I mean, he didn't really do a final mix because right. you know, obviously, that's a whole day we could talk mm-hmm. about. But sure. what he did is he, he, it was more about capturing the sound properly. Mm-hmm. And then he talked a little bit in the second half of the day for just you know the last part of the day about how he processes. Actually, another thing that he did that I don't do is he, because you have so many microphones that you're recording, he was able to, he really EQ'd every mic. Mm-hmm. Like he, I don't, I typically don't EQ to the recording. Mm-hmm. I kind of just let the signal be what it is. You know, if it doesn't sound right, I use a different mic or move it, but I don't really go in and dial up a different EQ mm-hmm. because I'm afraid that if I do something, I might need to undo it in the mixing process. So, mm-hmm. but he just went for it because he had so many mics, he made each mic adapt to the sound he wanted and that way he said the the sound of the drums is closer to the final sound if you do that you know right okay. so you know you, you you just have to know what you're looking for so if, the, if you're going to do processing on the input right you really kind of have to know what the final project sure. is supposed to sound like sure. because you're committing to things that you can't undo right later on so if you're that skilled to do that, then it almost helps in a way to hear the full sound in that moment. Right? Yeah, he knew what he was looking for. He, he was mm-hmm. like, you know, dialing things up. But I think the benefit of that is that because you have so many choices, you're not really screwing things up because I only have a certain amount of mics on a drum kit. So I can't really go crazy with EQ because I don't have another set of mics sure. that can balance that off in some way if I, if I made a an error, but he wasn't making errors. His decisions were like, this is what I want this mic to sound like. Right. And then he had some mics that were just meant to just sound like crap. Like they, they purposefully. They, yeah. Like yeah. he had a, a, he had one of these actually, an SM seven, uh, uh-huh. about, you know, 10 feet in front of the drum kit, just right. a mono mic source. And he brought that up and you're like, wow, that sounds good. It's, you know, you'd solo it and you're like, yeah, that's, that's nothing special. Mm-hmm. But then when you bring it in with all the other mics, all of a sudden it had a purpose. Right. And so it was pretty cool. And, That's a uh, lot of inputs. And the benefit, another benefit is that the people that went to that event. Well, that's what I was going to ask you because you are a 30 year veteran and you picked up some tips and tricks. Right. The people that signed up and took this class, they must have been blown they away. They were totally blown away. And uh, the other thing is that at some point, maybe next week or, or sometime soon, one of the things we promised them was that the the people that attended would get the recorded tracks of that session. Mm-hmm. So we have several segments of Doug playing drums for like 10 minutes or something or mm-hmm. whatever. That's with a great benefit. these 20 yeah. something mics recording it. Mm-hmm. So Evan, the engineer at the power station, New England is gonna put together folders with all these tracks and put them in and, and uh. somehow name the takes or whatever so that so they're going to have access to these drum tracks and then we gave the students a from neil's mic setup we gave each student a handout which had the mic sheet of what we did you know input right wise. sure so here's the kick in model here's the numbers kick out, and all here, that exactly yeah. model numbers yeah. okay polar pattern whatever information was needed and I mean, you could play with that you could play with all those inputs for a year yeah. And yeah. that's so my my idea about this master class was not just what happened that day. Yeah. But to allow the, the people that attended who like, you know, like, yeah, what, once what was their what was their once reaction? They, once they put their head back together, <laughs> you know, if they could piece their head back together from all the like, you know, I mean, they were really blown away because, you know, I, I had interaction with Neil for months mm-hmm. here and there. So it wasn't sure. like, you know, the first time I met him and stuff, it was kind of like, wow, that's cool. You know, I just this guy recorded brothers in arms or you know whatever right, but, sure. but he's just the coolest guy but these people were like wow he's showing me something really cool and and were they now what were they were they all taking notes and yeah like, they were, they were they taking all, notes and these yeah. weren't kids these were all like right people right because I'm, I'm sure you have to have a little bit prerequisite you can't come in there as well a we didn't have like a 
you know, no, but, right. But no one would have signed up for that masterclass unless they had a foundation. Well, right? you know, yeah. it, it, it wasn't free and it wasn't cheap. So it was right. like, people have to be serious about it, but sure. yeah, that's what we want. We want right. people that want to learn and focus. And, and if we made it five bucks and had 50 no, people, no, no, no. Right. it right. would have right. been not as special. Right. So this was intimate. And this was like, these guys were like, it um, sounds like an amazing opportunity. And now you're going to do another one of these. You we definitely, to, right? we definitely will, because everybody was totally into it. Even the drummer was like, "Hey, man, I want to do this again. This was, this now, was more than a masterclass." Do you think you know? he'll do drums, or do you think you'll do something else? I don't know. Or? It's, a, it's we can do whatever we want. That's yeah. the thing. It's like, what do we want to do? And we get together with guys and say, "Hey, that was cool, but how about we do this?" Or, or what I'd like to do is do that in another city. I think what we would do possibly next time is bring it into the city. You know, into sure. like Manhattan, not yeah, yeah, exactly and. Do you have noise problems in the city at all? When, you not, know, in the studios. Studios. not in those studios. Not in those studios. Right? studios. They're totally conditioned. I don't know how they do it. I mean, there's like office spaces around them, right? Right. And you're in New York City, but these studios, they don't have any. I mean, they're just so built. It's like a bomb shelter. You know, yeah. it's like you have to be because you can't annoy your neighbors. And yeah. that's a problem I've had over the years, obviously, with you sure. know, in a studio. That's one of the biggest problems with studios. But Power Station New England's in the middle of nowhere anyway, but right. it's like a fortress. Mm -hmm. so the big studios were like that because they had to be when you're having drums you're recording drums and right. rock bands and like metallica or somebody comes in you're gonna need some isolation you know yeah and, and big bands have, have recorded in those studios yeah, right yeah, yeah um do you know actually about evan was talking about working with prince mm -hmm. apparently prince had gone to the power station new england in the studio in manhattan or no the, the in, in connecticut connecticut yeah and what, prince oh, okay. was there oh no and, kidding. Uh, and other people like that so he I heard he's, he's you know he was eccentric and yeah, he was yeah they, he, to Evan was telling and, some stories that he just like I don't sometimes I just understand there's so many print stories it's yeah no he he said it was just like I I don't know if there was something like his genius was too mm -hmm. it just was like you know he was like five people mm -hmm. in five minutes you know yeah like he just like he was doing stuff or he worked really quickly and and but that's how it is with these people. They, they don't have time to waste. And a lot of times people like Prince or whoever, they're, they're such on this high genius level that they can't, like, you're going to get in trouble if that mic is not working right now. Right. You're going to get fired, whatever. It's, you know, they're like, that's I need intense. to do this now. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing I don't, I, you know, I knew that was going to happen in New York and stuff. You know, mm -hmm. if I went there out of college and I just yeah. wasn't ready for that. But yeah. it, uh, it, it's just cool that we can hopefully have more of these things. So... My job in this whole thing was to obviously to help promote it, but also to, to focus on the curriculum of the day. Sure. So I worked with Neil on, we discussed what we should talk about and offer that to, you know, kind of in order to promote the event, you know, let people mm -hmm. know what they were going to learn. Sure. Just like course, taking yeah. a course. If you're mm -hmm. going to pay money for a college course, you want to know what you're going to learn. So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of what I wanted to, I want to treat it like that. Okay. And focus on the educational value. It was very noticeable that this was, an education more than just like, hey, let's hang out with somebody famous, you know? So, sure. and Neil was very appreciative of that fact and he was honored to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a great experience for everybody. Now so, you have the template yeah. and- uh, No, it worked out really well and I, we definitely want to do it again. And my extension of these things eventually would be for the people that attended, they would get the, the recordings of that session mm -hmm. and then maybe give them 30 days if they, an optional added fee and whatever is to take what we give them for the tracks and do something with it sure. and resubmit it and talk about it for Neil or whoever to evaluate it and critique it, do a write up, do a video response mm -hmm. and to extend the educational value of that session. Sure. Both Neil and Doug were like, that's a great idea. We didn't do it for this one because we wanted to just have the show, have mm -hmm. the event because Doug says, wow, if, if they want to re if they want to mix these, I'd be happy to like give them critique about, how they mix the drums. So we may even do that. We may even approach them. That's my uh, vision for the the future ones is to get, kind of expand it further. So yeah, well, congratulations. Yeah. I mean, it sounded, it sounded yeah, it was, like it was awesome. It was just yeah. it, was, it was a great experience by everybody. And uh, I mean, just be in a studio like that for two days. It was just, you know, mm -hmm. it was just amazing. Have you ever seen these uh, these places where they, there's, there's absolutely no sound I've seen in people? Yeah, anechoic chamber. Yeah. What are they called? Anechoic 
chambers. And it, where they have the, what, the wood? Is it kind of wood strips or something? Yeah, that, it's really weird. Yeah, you talk. And, and I, then, I heard people kind of get really freaked out when they go into these chambers. Yeah, and it's very claustrophobic. No, you can it, almost hear your heartbeat, right? You can, yeah. It's like you're in a room like this big, but like when There's you talk, no, it's like you're talking right into your eardrum. You have no... There's no you, sound. Actually, you're, I think you're hearing your yourself sound. from inside your body. It's very, it's very unnerving. Yeah, it's a good way to. It would be a good, like, kind of torturous thing to you know put someone in there. They lose their mind because you do hear. I, I heard. Yeah, I mean, some people, if you're left in there, too you hear long, your blood pulsing in your in your eardrums and stuff. Yeah, it's really. Have you weird. ever been? I mean, some of the studios that you've been in are. are I, I've very, been in Anticoke Chambers. Um, yeah, there was one in uh, I think University of Hartford has one too that I went in. Uh, what was it like? Well, it's like being it, in, in, being inside your body. You know, were you like, in there alone at any time? No, we weren't in there alone. Just there was a couple of people. They closed the door, and then you're like, and you can whisper, and you go, "Wow, this is weird." And you like, sounds like you're talking radio. It sounds like you're whispering to yourself. Yeah, it's freaky. It's like, yeah, it's like the Maparium. Have you ever been there? The no. Maparium at the Christian Science Center. No, I haven't. It used to be free. Like when I was at Berkeley, it used to be free. You used mm-hmm. to walk in there. And the acoustic properties of that are, are such that it's it's a globe. Right. And there's this little walkway in the middle of it. And when you talk, the way that the, the walls are shaped, it, it reflects or, or contours. It's like you you can whisper and the person on the other side of the room can hear you. They call it a whisper room. Right. Like where, okay. you know, and there's, a, I think at Grand Central Station or something, they have a little, mm-hmm. little place where you can talk into the corner. It's like an arch and it actually... Goes the person the on the other side right. can hear it. It's yeah, like a, yeah, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. So this room is really cool for that. But yeah, but anechoic chambers are meant for like testing, mm-hmm. you know, so that you can test right. speakers and mics and you're not getting, the room is not influencing at all, but it's, it's, it is freaky. So yeah, so acoustic <laughs> spaces like that are really, that's yeah. a very unique space that's meant for like test and measurement. Right. You know, sure, so. Sure. So congratulations. Definitely think that there's going to be interest in subsequent years and you could do drums you could do acoustic guitar you could do vocals yeah it's endless it's like it could be anybody about any topic i've just found that these guys you know they haven't really been teaching and and unfortunately a lot of these guys like for instance neil he does he does teach a little bit at at peabody in Mm -hmm. uh, baltimore but Mm -hmm. for the most part these guys that had a great career in many cases aren't able to get teaching gigs sure because at this point most of those programs require a master's degree mm-hmm. you know and, and these some of these guys don't even have uh you know bachelor's degree in their field so mm-hmm. it's it's sometimes difficult for these guys once they kind of want to wind down their the crazy schedule and all that kind of thing and share that they're not able to get an official gig at a college because mm-hmm. of their credentials you know i mean their their yeah. lack yeah. of you know lack of uh, degrees and stuff but so i'm hoping that this type of thing gives them an outlet and it does it in a way that allows these guys to do their their sharing and get paid to talk about what they've done in a real sense instead of just like a lecture it's a hands-on thing and showing mm-hmm. exactly what they did and then there's a lot there was a lot of stories you know that that you know the one story that i that kind of blew me away about the dire straits album because brothers in arms to me was just an amazing album at the time you know had on cassette and it was mm-hmm. a big thing you know live aid they were there so he said that they were five weeks into this project and realized that the drums sucked. Yeah. And they had to redo all the drums, but they didn't use a click track for anything. Okay, so explain what a click track is. Well, the click track is what you would use to kind of play along to. So in the event that something had to be replaced or redone or, or new people come in and track on top of it, you've got this timing reference that you can follow. Mm-hmm. And then that gets muted out, obviously, and then the music is left with, with the, the tight tracks. And you know, nowadays, everything is recorded with a click and so you can copy and paste things easier but you know this was just multi-track tape machine mm-hmm. the band recorded the basics and there was no click reference they just played sure um and then to realize that the drums were not okay mm-hmm. all the music was on it and then the drums needed to be replaced and that's not an easy thing to do without a click reference so they ended up because, getting and because there's it's a time, like a time code kind of. Uh, well, it's just like you're playing along. You don't even know. Let's say there was a drum intro. So you can't hear the music. You can't play along. You can hear the music, but if you're if there's a drum intro, you don't know when the music is going to come in. So you actually have to play and hope that things line up. But once the music is is playing, then you can follow along. Oh, so it, it's sometimes really about the it's, intro. It's more like about the, the beginnings of the, the beginning. songs and things. Okay. Or maybe a drum breaks or something. It's like 
So there are places maybe in some of the songs that we're just going to be like, well, let's try it and see what happens. But, no kidding. Okay. So I need to go back and listen to the album again because I did not realize that they brought in Omar Hakim, who's a famous session player, to replay all the drum parts. And he did it in like two days. And he said, I don't, Neil said he, he didn't know at that time if there's anyone else in the world that could have done that. And, and that's just because aligning from all of the starting points well, for the whole album. Because you're not right? in the room. Right. Usually drummers will be in a room with everybody seeing people play. Mm -hmm. Like Bruce Springsteen, you know, mm -hmm. Max Weinberg and everybody's in the room. And you're seeing everybody when you're playing so you can follow along and you're in the, you know, sure. in the moment. But to play along to like a, a, for a, a, a drummer in that multi-mic context to play and, and make it sound like you were there the day of the recording, yeah. it's not easy to do. And in addition to that, Neil said, I'm recording over the original drum tracks to do this. So if this doesn't work, we don't have the original drum tracks anymore. That's because of the technology at the time. Yeah, they only right. had the one tape machine. They weren't <laughs> synced anything, you know, and so he was just like. So it was risky, it was very risky. Very and risky, because if you don't like this today, the old tracks are gone. There was no safety copies or nothing. So he was okay. just like, he's like the only drum that was saved on the entire album was the intro to Money for Nothing. And so what, and what happened was the original in. drums just, it didn't just sound, didn't sound right. They just, weren't full enough or yeah, something just, like that. It just, it was the playing and the sound. Yeah. And once the music was on it, uh, apparently Mark Knopfler said, you know, this isn't really happening. And, and mm -hmm. what do we do? It wasn't supposed to be as big of an album as it was. I think it, sure. it just turned into that eventually just it was because a huge, it was album. huge, but they, they didn't even know that was going to be that way. But know? that was also like right at the beginning of MTV. Yep. When yep. MTV and exactly. so they had the music video it was him and like, you know, who else did they have at the time? Like Billy Idol and like a handful of other right. people. Well, Sting that... was on that song. So that helped sell oh, it. Because yeah. Sting was singing the money for nothing. Yes, he did. And at the... the end, he does the don't yep. stand so close to me little riff at mm -hmm. the end of the song. And so that kind of helped. I think that guest appearance, especially because sure. the police were really big in 85. Oh, yeah. and, you know, I mean, they were like huge, right? So the do, do, do. Having, da, that, da, da. having that stuff is, well, synchronicity. Oh, you know, yeah. that was like. A little after that, maybe, but, but you know, I mean, they were big. Yeah. So to have somebody on your record like that mm -hmm. at the time was was helpful, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's why, because of that album, I think that's why Neil got the gig with Sting. He did a couple albums with Sting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the whole thing about do the best job you can, even though they this they didn't really have any idea this record was going to do what it was going to do. Neil did his best job. Apparently, Sting was impressed in some way, shape, or form. And he ended up doing at least two Sting albums mm -hmm. because of it. Mm -hmm. And because he did X, Y, Z, whatever, he ended up doing uh, Paul McCartney, Flowers in the Dirt. Wow. Yeah. And he actually played some examples during the session about that, like some different, you know, the Bruce stuff and, and McCartney. So you listen to the history of their, their experiences and they're just trying to work, you know, they're mm -hmm. just doing their job and stuff. So, but just hearing those stories was very helpful to understand you know, one thing about listening to these guys, whether it's an AES presentation or a hands-on thing, is that you are better able to understand the industry. So for me, I knew that studio owners were like always screwed mm -hmm. in some way, you know, in some way with buying equipment or paying for rent or whatever. And I just knew that that was always going to be what a studio was going to go through. So when I went through that, I, I just felt that was a normal thing. And I wasn't going to give up because of that. Because sure. I knew that this is the way it is. Just like when you understand your industry, the challenges of it, because of what you've heard and mm -hmm. you know people shared with you, you just know that this is what it is. And it definitely is difficult, you know, the family stuff and, you know, just the time you're away from you're working so much and, and weird hours and, and all that kind of stuff. It's very difficult on relationships and stuff. But if it's what you love to do, you just do it. And, you know, I mean, I don't even feel like I work. I mean, I do, I'm, I'm busy every single day of my life. I don't, sure. you know, I just, but I don't feel like I'm like, oh, I'm not oppressed. Like I need to go on vacation or something. Or mm -hmm. it just, you, if you like what you do, you're healthier, you're happier. And hopefully that grows because you're nurturing that. And, and I, I think this 30th anniversary thing was kind of when, like you made reference to earlier, I think that was when I f started to feel different things happening that were not just about sitting in the studio. They sure. were like, things yeah. that were going on outside of my because you know how do i well expand? past your was it ten thousand hours or yeah ten thousand yeah. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> I, I think i passed you, that like you passed that a long time ago, ago yeah. but yeah it's really but you know but it, it does, at some point it does take off and, and you know and you're going to have lulls and stuff too but it's just like you have to figure out how to diversify mm -hmm. um i wanted to try to figure out you know like with this master class i was trying to figure out ways to work 
not just in my studio how can i sure you know expand globally and things sure. like that so that's yeah. definitely something i tried to go for everyone is vying for your time now do you have to put in 30 years before you really catapult into kind of a new category i mean not everybody i mean some people the, you know like some people got successful really quickly after college you mm -hmm. know like i mean whether it's playing or, or engineering i think it was a year maybe a weird year ahead of me um, will calhoun was at berkeley as a drummer mm -hmm. and he ended up being the drummer for living color mm -hmm. and so just a couple years out of i think one year out of college for me because will was a year ahead of me I am at Foxborough Stadium watching the Rolling Stones for the Steel Wheels tour and Living Color was warming up for the Rolling Stones. A guy that I went to Berkeley with, mm -hmm. I knew him through a friend, but he was at Berkeley and he graduated in music production and engineering a year ahead of me. And then two years later, I'm like watching him warm up as a warm up band for the Rolling Stones at Foxborough. So, so some, he was the some, drummer. He's the, the drummer, drummer for, for Living Color. Yeah. Living, oh, yeah. Okay. So to see somebody go that quickly, mm -hmm. because Mick Jagger produced some of the album, mm -hmm. then they got pulled to do the tour with them for Steel Wheels, which is amazing opportunity. I mean, well, now what about a studio owner and a producer? You know, the career path. Most of those guys take thirty years. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, studios are in more of a slow progression. It's all about can you buy the equipment? Can you? have the right space but you've got then, a your passion has to be a hundred percent i mean you, you can't, can't flinch when at all right when you look at like a stack of bills like that and you've got no money to pay <laughs> them and you go okay what do i do and like you know so yeah it's very difficult and is it now know. is it the same though for people today well it's even harder i would well most people have smaller setups now so they yeah. try to go a little bit smaller but they're not really able to achieve like, you know, you just can't sit in your bedroom and finish an album. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you just, it has no depth to it. It's just, like I said earlier, you have to move some air. You just have to understand that the business is still about recording in a room, right. working with, you know, collaborating with people. And it's just, it's still that way. Even though people say there's no big studios anymore. It's like, well, there's still studios that have rooms. It's just that humongous studios are very few and far between now because you don't need, there's not as much need for that how are the students now compared to when you were a student in terms of maybe not even in terms of technology but just their approach and well one thing that's different and i learned this a long time ago when i was teaching at the new england institute of art i had to be a musician to get into berkeley okay right have a musical background to be fairly proficient and mm -hmm. to get in so i had a, an instrument that i played and then i chose a major okay when i was teaching at the new england institute of art it was an audio production program, but there was no requirement for you to play a musical instrument. Okay. So what so I a good noticed thing or a bad thing? It's not excellent. I mean, it makes you work harder because I think okay. that as an audio engineer, for me, and this is just speaking for me, I mean, there's a lot of people that do audio for a living that don't play an instrument. Mm -hmm. But for me, for what I did, the small studio where I'm producing. See, my studio is called Big T Productions because you're coming to the studio to work with me. Okay. So yeah. that's kind of a little bit of different thing that, that that I wanted to point out is that I wasn't, you weren't just renting, oh, here's the keys, I'll be back in sure. six hours. You weren't just renting a space that I built, you were renting a space and I was working in it mm -hmm. for you. So. Mm -hmm. That's why it's Big T Productions, because it's me. Mm -hmm. It's not just the room. The Big T. Yeah. So yeah. that that's the service I wanted to have people come to me because I had a place to work, but because I was the one engineering and playing mm -hmm. guitar or whatever. So so that's how I was able to survive. Mm -hmm. And I had the confidence, you know, not that I was an excellent player, but I just had confidence in what I was doing. You did. And, and what it I allowed you to, to take do. some risks that right. I don't think a lot of kids. Right. Today I jumped in the fire do. many times, but I got through it. So the thing about not knowing a musical instrument and trying to get an audio is that you don't have as much understanding about music theory, mm -hmm. which for me was big because I'm working with my singers and they, you know, it's like they don't know what to sing for harmonies. And so as a producer, I'm very helpful with that because I, I went through ear training at Berkeley, which is grueling. I hated that. Sitting in a room with you mm -hmm. know, 20 students and the teacher goes, all right, sing example number four using the solfege syllables. And you're like, <sighs> you know, and, and it was horrible. So, so I think the discipline was lacking mm -hmm. that 
also the you know one thing that i really think is good about my upbringing as a you know playing guitar as a you know six-year-old kid and, and beyond is that you have this discipline about practicing for your lessons mm -hmm. grueling as it was because i didn't like it for many years and then i the tables kind of turned where my parents couldn't stop me playing you know like my mom would just mm -hmm. can you just take a break <laughs> you know like because my amp was on and i'm playing for hours and hours and stuff like that mm -hmm. so I just think that that discipline that we go through learning a musical instrument, that weekly lesson and preparation, and if you're serious about it, you have this discipline. Mm -hmm. um, just like sports people have disciplines, right? So I think, you know, or the military. You so know, is that, now is that changed at all? Like what's it like now teaching? Um, well, a lot of the students don't have that, that global understanding of music. Mm -hmm. Even some of the older students, cause you know, the Berkeley Online students are college age to older, like, you know, people that are, second careers or even approaching retirement. So some of them never had that music theory. They play an instrument, but they don't read music or, so I think reading music was helpful for me, even though it's not necessary as an engineer, but looking at charts, you know, like what's wrong with that chord or why does that not work? I find that in the past few months, I have made simple suggestions in a session to the songwriter. Mm -hmm. And it blew their mind how much better that idea was than what they've been working with on their song. The, you know, the other day, this guy came in and recorded a song that we had already recorded, but he, he was able to sing it better. And he changed it a little bit and he's singing it. And I realized that when he was singing the chorus, it didn't sound like a chorus at all. It sounded like another verse. Mm -hmm. And until the end of the chorus, I didn't even know that was a chorus. So I told him that. I said, well, you're going to need to change the melody, at least in the first line of the chorus, so that we know it's a new section. Mm hmm and I said, why don't you do this? And I played a little something on the guitar. I went and got the guitar and I played a little melody. And, and he liked it. And he really liked it. Nice. But he couldn't just sing it. So now right. he has to go home and practice it again and come <laughs> back in. And then he changed it a little bit, but he changed it in a way that still worked. So I, 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 I wanted him to differentiate this section. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole point. So he did it in his own way, but he took my idea and kind of made it work for him. That's great. Um, so it's just something you hear. Mm -hmm. And what, what I, and it's great because it makes me, you know, when I write my own songs, it mm -hmm. makes things easier because there's things that you know work and don't work. You go, nope, this doesn't work. Let me do this. Or If you were to give someone who is looking not to necessarily be a musician or maybe they are a musician, but they want to go to a similar career path as you specifically, not, not as a musician, not as a rock and roll star, but what do you think is the one or two pieces of, Sage well, advice. I think, you know, you, you want to go out and get some experience at some other facility or, you know, or get a really decent, you know, there's a lot of work in the field that pays really well, like, mm -hmm. like audio for sports, or mm -hmm. I know some people that, that do sports events, mm -hmm. the audio, you know, for the Bruins or whatever, and they go to the, they go to the Olympics and do the sound for that. So there's ways you can make money in that field. If you're into that kind of thing, broadcasting is a much better paying thing, but music is not as much a, a paying gig as you don't for the royalties and stuff, but pick something that you like to do. Try to be your own boss as much as possible. If you rely on working for another studio, you're kind of vulnerable because mm -hmm. of what's going on with studios closing. Or if you're at the mercy of management, you're, yeah. you, you know, you're not helping yourself. So luckily I started my studio when I lost my job at Ticketmaster. Right. You know, so it's like have something to fall back on that you're doing. Luckily I'd already started my studio, but even if you're working for various companies like sound companies or, or whatever, you still want, you're still your own boss mm -hmm. and you want to make sure that you're not putting all those eggs in one basket because a company could go under quick and then you're done. And so having your own independent projects or independent mm -hmm. gigs that you're doing in addition to your day gig, even if it's audio or not, you just want to make sure you diversify. And that's definitely the way to kind of keep going because if something dries up, you've got other stuff to focus on. And you're mm -hmm. not just like, oh, I'm out of a job, I get nothing. And, and you're really, now you're desperate to do something and you may not be able to continue to do music. So I think that's great advice. How do people get in touch with you if you have the time? <laughs> uh, well, they, they anybody wanted, can, you know, yeah, anybody can reach me through my website, bigtproductions.com. Well, uh, listen, uh, thank you so much for being here. Cool. Uh, yeah, it was great. A great conversation. And, yep. uh, you know, I hope to have you back yeah. on uh, another podcast. Yeah, and, happy to uh, do it. We'll see you again soon. The links and all the information posted down below. So check that out. All right. Appreciate all right. it. Great. Thank you. Thank you.